morning. Good morning, Alec. It's an honor to welcome each and every one to our morning worship service here at Bethlehem United Methodist Church. If we're honored to have you visiting with us today, please take the opportunity to fill out a visitor's card and place an offering plate during our tithe and offering. Our beautiful flowers today have given to the glory of God in memory of Mr. and Ms. W. Green Deschamps, Mr. and Ms. W. Green Deschamps Jr., and Mr. Bill Deschamps by Mr. and Ms. Green Deschamps. So great to have each and every one. Uh, please look at your bulletin for activities going on this week. Family Supper is Wednesday night. Uh, at this time, we'll turn to our choir for intro. time we'll have our opening prayer. Uh, could you stand with us for this please? And then we'll have our opening hymn. Let us pray. Like the sun that is far away and yet close at hand to warm us, so God's spirit is ever present and around us. Come creator into our lives. We live and move and have very being in you. Open now the windows of our souls. Amen.
morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Good, we're all here. Welcome to Bethlehem United Methodist Church. You may be seated. And I just want to say it is a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. It is uh, a little chilly outside, but it's warm in here, not just because of the heat, but because of your warm, smiling faces and your hearts that have come to gather to worship the Lord. So I want to uh, invite all of our kids to come forward for the children's lesson. Where y'all gonna sit? Y'all gonna sit here or on the floor? Doesn't matter. Anybody else? Okay. Well, good morning. All right, I got a question. What What does it mean to be a good Christian? Is, see, I, you know, if somebody was to ask me that, I'd. I'd give y'all the same look that y'all are giving me right now. Um, and I think that um, for me to understand things, I have to keep it really simple, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let y'all help me describe or show what being a good Christian is, okay? I want everybody to stand up and do not eat these. I want you to put them in your hands. Come on. Come on, Ellie, man. Come on, Alec. Come on, stand up, stand up, stand up. I want you to give these out. Yeah, Put, oh, open your hands, open your hands. Come on, get all those, get all those up. Open them up. All right, now walk around and just give them out to the people. Give them out to our, to our congregational members, okay? Just give them away. Here, grab them. Here. Okay. To anybody. Go on out there. Go all the way to the back. Cade, go give some to the choir. Okay. All right. All right. All right, Lawson, go give them away. Go. Here. Now turn around. Go. Give them away. Go. Go. All right. Go give them away. Just go give them to people. Go. Go. Just pick anybody. Y'all, please hold your hands up if you want. One, please. Go, Ellie. Go. Come on. Got to give them all away. We can't go further until they're all gone. Can't go further. Please raise your hand so they'll know what to do. You done? All right, Lawson's done. Cade's done. All right, all right. Whoop, nope, nope, nope. You can't. Uh-uh. Go give them away. Go give them, go give them away. Right over there. You might have got any left. Can't have any left. You're good. All right, all right, come on, let's rock and roll, come on, all right, you can put that one in your pocket, I'll let you slide on that one, so, when y'all were, when y'all were giving out all that candy, I have fake, a fake pocket, I got fake pockets too, mine don't work either, all right, sit down, sit down, all right, so, when y'all were giving out that candy, to our congregation out there, all of our Christian family, did they smile? You think you made them happy? Pretty cool, huh? But what they give? What they give you? Well, they did. They really did give you something because part of being a Christian is just being a good person and doing good things for people without expecting anything in return. And that, uh, I, boy. That's how simple and, and, and easy it is to be a good Christian, is to do good things for people without expecting anything in return. Well, thank you. So, you know, just be good and do good things for people without expecting anything in return, and you'll come to find that you'll end up, I know you're not going to understand this, but you're going to end up finding out in life that you will receive a lot more than you ever give if you do it in the, in the spirit of God. I got one more thing I want to read to you. 
If I can get into Sherry's phone. And I'm thinking there's probably only one person in this congregation who happens to be a, a he's not a, really a guest, but he grew up in this church. Um, I just want to read something to you guys and to you guys. Um, this is a quote uh, from a drummer from one of my favorite bands. And it just kind of goes along with what we try to do. It says, the feeling that we have here, remember it. Take it home and do some good with it. And I'll leave you with this. Please be kind. Amen. Okay? Oh, you all want to pray? Okay. All right, we can pray later. Bye. Oh, y'all want some candy? Oh, oh, now I know. Everybody gets two. Everybody gets two. Go, grab them. There you go. There you go. Everybody gets two. Ellie May. Katie May. You got, you got plenty? <laughs> Here.
thank you, choir, for that. In the life of our, of our church, we have several who are sick, who are at home, uh, folks who are having uh, medical uh, testing done. We have those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. And so we gather those together in our prayers, in our hearts, and aloud together uh, in this time. Will you pray with me? Blessed are you, O God, creator of the universe and the giver of all good gifts to your children. You are great and are to be lifted high in praise. You are a different God, high and holy, above us and above all creation. We thank you that you have not forgotten us, not abandoned us, and not rejected us despite all that speaks against us. In your own dear Son, Jesus the Christ, you have given us nothing less than yourself and all that is yours. We praise you that we are invited as guests to your table of mercy and grace as we worship you. This morning we bring to you all that troubles us, our mistakes and sins, our sorrows and cares, our rebellion and bitterness, our whole heart and life, better known to you than to ourselves. We commit all this into your faithful hands. We pray that you take us as we are, strengthen us when we are weak, and help us be responsible with the bounties of your blessings. O oh God, let your loving kindness shine upon us and upon all that we love. Shine upon those who are suffering, upon those who are sick, and upon those who have experienced grief and loss. In this time of turmoil and division, let your justice roll down upon our nation's government and upon the nations of power around the world. May we all learn to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Let your peace become primary among the leaders of the world. Give us all wisdom and insight so that we become instruments of your love and peace. Give us all a clear and courageous witness so that we may stand firm in our faith and not cower in the face of adversity. Open our hearts and our understanding so that we can respond to your children in our town and around the world who are hungry, who are homeless, who are lonely. Create in us a true spirit of humility and grace and give to us and to all who worship you this day what we need to become all that you've created us to be. We offer ourselves to you in that same spirit in which you offered yourself to us. We offer ourselves to you in the love of Jesus the Christ, who taught us his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, just a note before we move into our affirmation of faith, and I think it's poignant to place it at this time. But on February the 22nd, uh, there is a special general conference being called of the United Methodist Church. General conference is represented by clergy and laity from all around the world. Um, our conference is here in, uh, this, in, in this country and central conferences in other places in our country from Africa to the Philippines. And, uh, and they are making a uh, discerning a, a path forward as a church uh, around some issues. And ultimately, our desire is for unity in our church. And we have folks who have different perspectives on what that looks like, how it should be lived out in local churches and in annual conferences. And the hope and the prayer is for unity. And uh, I'm going to be posting some links on Facebook, and we'll put some links uh, 
if you uh, will put some things in the bulletin for you, we'll send out an email, maybe with some prayers, with some information, uh, some sort of succinct information that we can give you. Um, and we're thinking about having uh, maybe a, an after, a Sunday afternoon or a, um, an evening uh, conversation, uh, maybe an hour or so, just to kind of give some of that information out there so you can talk about it. We can uh, dispel any, hopefully dispel any um, grave concerns that would bring us into a place of, of fear, a place of, of uh, unrest. And, um, but ultimately, the thing we can do is even, and I, being in the midst of all of it, I don't understand all of it. There are so many different working parts to this. But as a church and the um, Bishop Harvey, who is the bishop in the Louisiana Conference, uh, said this in a video a couple of days ago. Uh, she said, right now, the things we can do are pray, pray for our delegates that go. We have 12 delegates from our annual conference, lay and clergy that will go, and, and they, will, they will vote as representatives of our conference. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, while we are praying for those delegates, uh, and we are going to send a letter as a church, I'm going to send a letter to those delegates to say that we will stand in prayer with them as they prepare to go. Uh, it'll be held in St. Louis. Uh, there will be some li a live streaming of the proceedings, uh, so that you can, you know, if you want to get in on that and watch what's happening and listen to what's going on, you can do that. So I'll send you some information through email, through Facebook. Uh, so we can pray for them first of all. Secondly, we can have good conversation, and I'll get you as much information out there as you need. But as Bishop Harvey said, first and foremost, we have a mission field that still needs us. And as a church, Bethlehem Church, we will continue to serve the mission field that God has given us. That we are a church that works together. We are a church that loves together. And we will never let that stand in our way. Amen? Amen? We have a mission field, and we are a people who stick together, and we are a people who love each other and love our community, and we're going to do that. And I believe, as our, not only has our denomination been around since 1784, when John Wesley brought it over, over the pond, so to speak, that it has endured many crises and it has overcome. And the reason is, I believe, that just as Jesus told Peter, that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And you can say, that's on a macrocosmic level, but on the micro, on the smallest details, as we look into our own personal lives, God has been faithful. God has never stopped being faithful to each of you. Think of any time in your life that you've gone through a difficulty. God has never left you. God has never forsaken you. God will never leave or forsake us as the United Methodist people. And we will continue to serve. We will continue to love God. We will do the three basic rules. We will do no harm. We will love others and we will attend to the mission field and to the ordinances of God. We will do what God has called us to do because splashing that water on us, God has called us and God has kept us. And I believe that firmly. So God will lead us through this. So I will get more information out there for you. You can go on umc.org. Uh, if you want more information, you can also go on our conference website, umcsc.org and get some more information. And I'm willing to uh, talk about their, uh, the, the plans that are, uh, uh, that are going to be before the conference, any questions you may have, and, uh, and then we can maybe have a little open forum session to kind of get some information out there um, and hopefully give you some, uh, maybe some peace of mind as to how things are going and staying, staying up to date. Okay? So, as timeless as God is, we see an affirmation of faith before us that stands to that timelessness. So let us offer ourselves in our affirmation of faith. And I invite you, as you are able to stand, 
as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed that has outlasted everything and will outlast everyone until the day of Christ. So we boldly say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. forgiven and reconciled people of God, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. You may be seated. Gracious God, you are so amazing at how you give to us in our time of need, and you also give to us in ways that we look back and realize how you have prepared us for what lied ahead. And so we are thankful for all that you do for us. We are thankful for friends and family, for life and health, and for all that is around us that gives us a sense of beauty and love and grace. So bless these gifts. 
Bless the giver and those who desire to give. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can I say something before I read our scripture? Don't we have an awesome pastor? Amen? Please join me. We're reading from Acts chapter 20, verses 32 through 35. And now I'll commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You know for yourselves that I worked with my own hands to support myself and my companions. And all this I have given you an example that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Just a simple review of the teaching of Jesus could be summarized in just one word, give. There is a blessing in giving. And in our scripture this morning, Paul echoes Jesus' teaching. The first thing that the writer says is that I want you to remember the gospel, first of all. Remember the good news that has been passed down Remember that you are a sinner saved by grace alone. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You are a sinner saved by grace. And so the writer says, I want, you to com I want to commend to you that gospel. I want you to live that gospel out. I want you to enjoy the inheritance of those who believe the gospel. 
eternal life. And the second thing he says is, I didn't live, Paul says, I didn't live among you in greed. I didn't live among you in some way to try to get something from you. You see, these were the last words that Paul was speaking. And when you're doing your last words to people, you want to convey the important stuff. And what's important to Paul is, if you are a people who believe that you are sinners saved by grace and not by works, then you will live lives of radical generosity. If you, if you know of your spiritual and heavenly inheritance, you will be radically generous with your earthly inheritance. Because as we learn from Job, you came into the world with nothing and you leave with nothing. And so Paul urges the people to care more about the poor than about material possessions. Now, as a minister, I've heard all kinds of confessions. <laughs> I've heard a lot. Now, I'm bound by law. I cannot reveal anything, and I wouldn't dare it even if I weren't. But I have never once, honestly, I have never once heard someone come into my office or, or take me aside or call me up or anything and said, Pastor, I want to tell you, I, spent t I spend too much money on myself. That's because no one really knows when they're being greedy. Someone else is greedier than I am, right? We rationalize it, and we believe that we should. Now, I'll give you my confession. I am a bookaholic. Hi, I'm Suzanne. I'm a bookaholic. <laughs> I need to have a support group, really. And recently, I've had this realization, this, this revelation probably, that my, where my desire from, to own books comes from. I'm a pastor, and I derive my identity from my authority. So somehow, when I see all those books up on my shelves, that feeds into the sense of being so smart and so authoritative. Is my main identity, to, does, does my value rest in what Jesus thinks of me, how he loves me? Or is it in people saying, oh, you are so smart. <laughs> it's both, and the two are in tension. They fight with each other all the time. And the way I know whether it's a fight, I have to fight, or, or not, is how easy it is to spend money on books. Now, some of you might say, well, there are worse vices in the world. But I tell you, it's, it could be something else. For all of us, we have different things. Maybe for some of you, the fight is how effortless it might be to spend money on clothes. Some of you, maybe your significant security comes from looking pretty or handsome. Uh, the, the money isn't the idol. It's that desire to be something to show to others that we are, uh, that we have it all or that we have it together. Others of you might, might say, well, I don't spend money on any of that stuff. You pride yourself on how frugally you live. You don't spend any money anywhere because you're trying to control and protect your own environment. You're not an approval freak like me. You're a control freak. <laughs> Doggone it, I thought she was going to lift us up this morning. Should have stayed in bed. <laughs> There's a story that I read by uh, Clara Knoll. And she says, for years we lived in the small town with one bank and three churches. <laughs> and early one morning, the bank called all three churches with the same request. Could you bring in Sunday's collection right away? We're out of $1 bills. <laughs> oh, that hurts my heart. <laughs> hurts my ego, too. So there's four things here that I want us to take away. 
First of all, there is, there is a joy of realizing that everything we are and everything we have belongs to God. Now that is not the sense of God just hoarding everything from us and only giving us this little meager allowance, but it's the idea of having someone who knows more about us and who cares more about us helping us to manage life in front of us, to manage the resources that we have. You know, when you were growing up and your parents took care of things, made sure that you had clothing and food and getting you off to school, it's I, I see it as that, that God's parenting of us in the case of our, of our, our resources, our money and our possessions, this is very much the same way as when we were growing up. Someone who loved us and who cared about us and someone who knew a little bit more, in God's case a lot more than we do about our lives, looking out for us and helping us to live the best life we can and live a life that's generous. How many of you want to be generous with your life? Now, I would expect everybody to raise your hand because the rest of you I'm worried about. How many of you want to be generous with your life? I do too. I don't, I don't want to be somebody that's scared I'm going to run out. I don't want to be someone that is fearful that I'm not going to have enough. I, I want to be generous. I want to give the most to my kids. I want to give the most to my church. I, I want to give the most of my talents and my gifts to the world around me. I, I don't, I, I don't want to be so, so meager with, with that. I want to be generous. And, and, and the first thing is realizing that who we are and what we have all belongs to God. And that portion that we give of our resources is a representation of our commitment to give 100% of ourselves to God. When we give in the offering plate, when we give of our time, when we give of our prayers and our presence and our gifts and our service and on our witness, does that sound familiar, United Methodist? Those are the vows we take when we join the church. We take those vows, we give of any of those things. All of those things, hopefully. Hopefully we're not picking and choosing one or the other to give. Well, I'm going to give time, but I'm not going to give gifts. Or I'm going to give prayers, but I'm not going to give presence because it's, it's prayers, comma, presence, comma, gifts, comma, service, comma, and witness. And it's all of those things that we are committed to each other in all of those things. But anytime we give a portion of ourselves in those to God's work and to be generous to those around, around us, it is a commitment that we belong 100% to God. Money is one of those things that we can't give without meaning it. So when we give of our resources, the commitment runs deep and it truly affects us. And this really is good news to recognize that all we are and all we have comes from God and belongs to God. Why? Because it instills trust and gratitude at the same time. It drives out pettiness and greed and the anxiety that comes from the constant nagging feeling that you never have enough. The more you give, the more you realize, you know what, I, I, I do have more than I thought. And in God's economy, Contentment is the spirit. Not having everything, it's saying, I'm okay where I am. I've got what I need. It all belongs to God anyway because God provides all our needs. The second thing that we can walk away from, uh, from here with is that there is the joy of loving God. We all love God, don't we? And we love God and the joy of expressing that love through gifts that demonstrate our praise and adoration of the God who is so good to us. In other words, it's as we say that we, we offer ourselves in the communion liturgy, it says we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. It goes back to that well-known verse from Vacation Bible School, for God so loved the world that he gave. He 
gave. He loved us and he gave. Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. He gave even when we didn't deserve it. He came and he gave because that's who he is. We don't buy God's love with our obedience because God has already given his love to over 2,000. Before eons of time ever started, God gave his love. God gave his love the minute he said, in, he said let there be light. The moment he started creating creation and creating all that we have around us, he loved. And I imagine that love as the spirit that the, at Genesis said was brooding over the waters like a hen broods over her chicks. That spirit moving upon the face of creation with love. Do y'all remember the, the famous book at one time, Dr. Gary Chapman, who wrote the Five Love Languages book? You remember that book? And, uh, and he talks about it a lot with couples, but he offered five distinct categories of how we can show love to each other. One of those was words of affirmation. Another one was quality time, you know, spending good time with each other, doing something together. Gifts, giving something to another acts of service, you know, doing something for someone, like uh, he said it could be as simple as uh, doing the dishes without being told, just recognizing that, some, that uh, your partner, your significant other, whoever, would want uh, that touches their heart when you do something for them. And also just the simple act of physical touch. And Dr. Chapman recognized that love is more than just a feeling. And he saw that people really did love each other, but they just didn't always know how to express that love in such a way that the other recognized it. So as I said before, in our vows that we take as members, we pledge our prayers and our gifts and our service and our witness. Those are the five love languages of our church. We promise to share ourselves we promise to share our thoughts and prayers, our money and resources, our energies and talents, and we promise to share the good news of Jesus Christ by standing up for the ones without a voice. The third thing that our text brings out to us is that there is joy there is the joy of pleasing God and of receiving the rewards and blessings that God promises to bestow upon us. This is the most straightforward of the verse. It is more blessed to give than to receive. We hear this and we believe it, and at the same time we can doubt that sentiment. But, but why is that? We get captured by the cult of the mall. We buy into, pun intended, the illusion that by spending for something new, we can make ourselves into something new. But 2 Corinthians promises us that all those who are in Christ are a new creation. Lamentation says that God's faithfulness and mercies are new every single morning. And even if it's not morning time, if you need a fresh start at midnight, God's mercies are new in that moment. Whenever you need a fresh start, whenever you need to start over, God is faithful to do that. And then lastly, there is the joy of benefiting others with our gifts. This is the simplest one of all. We give so that others may have. We are blessed with so much when we count our blessings. When we, when, uh, when we each offer something small to others, we see how much others could have. We want to see folks free from hunger, a lack of clothing, especially in the cold months. We want to see people free from oppression and injustice. And when we give of our own 
to special offerings when we give to our church, those monies go to benefit others in places that we may never see and help people we may never know. Your apportionment dollars, when you give to this plate and our church gives to our apportionments, our apportionment dollars go to provide relief for those affected by hurricanes right here in our state and even beyond. Recently, your apportionment dollars provided computers at Africa University, which is a United Methodist Center, to help people train for jobs and find work. You put a dollar in a plate, and that dollar can go around the world to help others. Folks, when we give, it's not about keeping the lights on. It's not about paying salaries. Those things are important. But when we give, we give in order that others may have. And so we as a congregation have the opportunity to embrace the life we've always wanted. We have the chance to decide if we trust the Lord and believe in his word. And Paul speaks to us. In all this... I have given you an example that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We are invited to an adventure in faith, and this is the path in living the life that we've always wanted. We are blessed in giving. Amen?
and share the love of God to those in this world that whom love is a stranger, so that they may find in you generous friends. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.